we've always covered books about Steve Jobs and Apple on this show. We had uh, Walter Isaacson. We had Adam Leshinsky. And now we're very fortunate to have the author of an innovative, original new book about Steve Jobs and Apple called Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success. It's written by Ken Siegel. And Ken is no objective, dispassionate journalist. Ken is a guy who worked with Steve Jobs eight years at Next and four years at Apple. And so he was in and continues to be in a, in a very uh, advantageous position in terms of understanding the insane simplicity that explains much of Apple's success. Ken, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Thank you. Glad to be here. Insanely simple, Ken. Why the book? Well, <clears throat> I actually think there's a lot to be learned about uh, from the way Apple works, uh, practical advantages for anyone who has a business or an organization. And I think uh, too often the world has been swept up in all these you know, behind the scenes stories or they're kind of juicy gossip, that kind of thing. And I thought nobody's really taken a look at, at what it is, what principles drive Apple and how you could use those principles to, to better your own organization. Before you talk about the book, Ken, tell me a little bit about your career. How did you first meet Steve Jobs? Well, interestingly, I was working on Apple in Los Angeles, um, an advertising guy. and uh, Don't I Don't look like one. <laughs> I'm dressed nicely today, but uh, trust you. me, that's unusual. But I am wearing sneakers. Um, the, uh, I was working on Apple under John Scully's rule, and, and we were doing uh, The bad old stuff. guy, right? Uh, the yeah. the ex-Pepsi guy. <laughs> really. Uh, and to be honest, it was cool to work on Apple, but it was, uh, uh, it was like working for a big company in many ways. But, you know, it was still cool. And the people who were working at the ad agency were, were former Shiat people who had worked on Apple uh, in Steve Jobs' time. But anyway, I uh, left there and I took the opportunity to move to New York to work on Next, which was a bit unusual. I had to move 3,000 miles east to work on Next uh, with Steve Jobs. And Next was the thing that Steve did after he left Apple. Correct. Uh, so he, he uh, was two years into Next at that time and was ready to start advertising. Uh, as, most, as many know, he you know, took a couple of years to, to conceive and create the Next computer. But when he was ready to start advertising, I got the offer to move because I was an Apple guy, come to, come to New York and work on What was Next. it like working with Steve at Next? Um, well, it's interesting. You know, like a lot of things in life, it's interesting only when you look back at it. I mean, obviously, it was interesting at the time as well. But looking back to see how Steve uh, behaved and how, how he acted with a brand new company. You know, he, had, he was somewhat, you know, humbled by having, you know, by the way it ended at Apple and was suddenly a man, you know, with a new company and had, had to uh, inspire a whole new set of, of uh, employees and, and create a new vision and just really start from scratch. So it was, it was just interesting to see him in that environment, you know, versus what he became later when I worked with him at Apple. I assume, though, you, you were witness to some of his notorious meltdowns? I've seen one or two in my time. Um, I was actually the, on the receiving end of, of one or two. <laughs> but over 12 years' time, I thought that was a pretty What's good like? performance. How, what was it like to be screamed at by Steve Jobs? Um, well, I think since it happened to a lot of people, um, I, I think it was just kind of part of the experience. I don't think you know, people didn't run away screaming and quit. Um, you knew you were part of something that was uh, that was special, and um, you know he was upset about a thing normally. You know, like in in my case, one of the cases that I'm remembering, it was uh, the first insert we were creating for like Time or Newsweek. We would do like these 12 page inserts for new products in those days, and uh, the keyboard was not the right color. You know, Steve had gotten the final thing, and it was like that's the wrong color blue. That's not the Bondi blue, and it's like, <laughs> well, that's the picture your people gave us. That's all we had to work with. And you know, it just caused a meltdown. So you were a, a, a lifetime marketing executive. What did Steve even at Next teach you about marketing? Well, actually, uh, there are a couple of uh, stories in my book. One in particular, um, they're, they're little things, but they're, they're meaningful things that stuck with me. And, and one is that I was part of, a, you know, I guess, my mentors in advertising would teach me how to do things when I was just a little baby writer. And uh, one was that you'd give a, a, an explanation of what you were about to show someone. You sort of like, you know, wind them up and get them ready to, to like something. I started to do that with Steve like the first time, and it was just like basically shut up, show me the work. 
you know, I'm a big boy and I can look at it and, and make up my own decisions. You don't have to sort of set me up for it. So uh, in later years in my life, I would actually use that with other clients. Like, well, you know, Steve Jobs didn't like those long-winded introductions. So here's the ad. What do you think of it? So I shouldn't have even given you an introduction in this show. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. But thank you. Uh, and then you went back with Steve to Apple after he went back after Next. Correct. And w I know you have one particular claim to fame in, in, uh, in the history of marketing and, uh, and Apple. What did you <laughs> invent? Well, I will humbly confess that I'm the guy who came up with the I thing. I, I came up with the name iMac, and uh, it was uh, not uh, a simple thing to do, although, again, in hindsight, it's like, obviously, iMac, Internet, new Mac. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but at the time, you know, things never seemed quite that easy, and Steve actually hated the name, and we had to go back and forth a few he times. He hated it? He, he hated it. He used the H word. What is uh, the H word? You hate. can say Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, well, but, there was nothing in between love and hate for Steve, right? No, you went straight from hate to love, didn't correct. you? Or from love to hate. I think that's generally the case. You know, we'd show, you know, there were a lot of uh, commercials that we'd show him that was like, you know, I don't like it. It doesn't do anything for me, and, you know, I want something, you know, something else. And then, uh, you might try a few new things and come back to where you were, and he's perfectly happy with it. But you, you needed to explore you know, new things before he would be happy with the first I thing. hope you, copyright, you copyrighted the eye. <laughs> I've often thought that, you know, <laughs> you know had I you know, gotten a mere point oh oh one of a cent per item, I might do all right. But no, unfortunately, uh, one must sign one's life away when you work at an ad agency. Well, Ken, the, the I concept, of course, is insanely simple, and it's one of the, the great marketing achievements of Apple. Talk to me more about this idea of um, insane simplicity. What is it, and why does it drive Apple? Well, it's a very good question. Um, and I think, to me, um, like I say, this was really, this, this book is the result of, of years of, of observations in that, you know, it's like, uh, again, one of the things that seems simple in hindsight. Um, but it's hard to write about something as simple as insane simplicity. It, it is. I mean, because, you know, one of the ideas that it's not easy to be simple and it, it, it looks, simplicity has this bad habit of looking so simple and looking so obvious that anybody could do it. But obviously it takes a lot of work and, and you know, Steve and Apple are a good proof of that. But I think uh, the great thing about simplicity in Apple is that you can literally see it in everything Apple does. I mean, obviously it's in the products, and that's why the products are popular. But, um, but it's in the way the company is organized, and it's in the it's in the advertising. And that was one of the things Steve used to do with with our ads. It's like it's it's too complicated. You know, I, I it's got to be simpler. So, um, and we thought we were being simple, you know, but it wasn't quite simple enough for Steve. So he wanted things. Uh, you know, I, I think. Pretty much any opportunity he had uh, about anything, products, organization, advertising, he would take the simpler path. That was just you know part of him. It's paradoxical. There are few men of the last century who are more complex than Steve Jobs, and yet right. he was capable of such remarkable simplicity when it came to his products. I'm guessing that the mental process is, is key in terms of realizing simplicity. Is that fair? I think so, and I think um, another conclusion I draw, which might be uh, too simple, one, if there is such a thing, um, is that the right decision is very oftentimes obvious, um, and it's a question of sort of doing the right thing. I think Steve was really good at doing the right thing. And my experience at other companies like Dell and Intel and, and other places was that even if that path was obvious, you know, do we do, you know, path A or path B, path A might be the obviously right thing to do, but maybe it costs a little bit more or it's going to take a little bit too much time and we don't want to do that or it's going to make someone mad or something. I think the beauty of the way Steve worked was that he would just look at something and say, you know, that's right and I'll do it. And sometimes that might have even cost more money, but in the long run, it would make him more money because it would make a better product. We have a large audience, Ken, of web developers and programmers at TechCrunch. Uh, and I've always found when I've worked in companies that people on the product side often struggle with the idea of simplicity. Was that fair at Apple? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you read um, a lot of the, the interviews with Johnny Ive, for example, I mean, uh, again, it's something that looks simple when you see the final product, but, you know, the stories about the, the design of the iPhone and, you know, how many buttons is it going to really have and, um, or, or, or a lot of the, the stories about Steve and, and, you know, reviewing software um, and, and how complicated it's going to be for someone, you know, to, you know, I just want them to be able to push one button to accomplish their task. And a lot of times people, you know, a designer will think something's very, very simple. And then, of course, Steve would come along and say, not simple. Steve invented, I think, the idea of radical simplicity. What companies or individuals do you see now carrying that banner outside Apple? Uh, hmm. Uh, Is there anyone? You know, it's hard to come up with one. I know, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I focus on, on, you know, Apple and its competitors. And, and I see, you know, in, in the world of Android, for example, um, you know, I, I see people trying to match features, but I don't see people trying to match, you know, that, that simplicity, uh, you know, the, the part of, of the Apple product that really bonds with its custom, with its owner, you know, I mean, you, 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 you love your Apple product, whereas, you know, other uh, hardware makers tend to, you know, shoot for the features and, and not the love. Ken, simplicity is, of course, all, also brevity. Uh, this is a, a short but very important and interesting book. We have a lot of entrepreneurs, startup entrepreneurs watching us as well, who, who, who would like to um, include or, or, or make their products, their services, uh, their, their companies insanely simple. And very briefly, in a minute, how do you do that? Well, I think, um, you know, when you think about simplicity and, and innovation, how do, you, how do you innovate it in a simple way? I think people tend to concentrate on the actual product or the idea. Um, what my book talks about really is a lot of the processes behind the invention. And I think, I think where people fail is, is to not have a, uh, or a company could fail, is to not have a system set up that supports simplicity. So you may have designers who are you know raring to go and, and have all these great ideas but you know these systems people have in place of you know testing by focus groups and and you know and and having 10 people work on something when four people could do a better job these things that sort of enable simplicity are, are actually um, as at least as important as you know the guy sitting in the room saying I'm going to design this product I think that's what Apple really really does well is that they have processes in place that are just vastly simpler than their competitors so committees don't help simplicity. You know, classic thing. It, it's it's absolutely true. And you, I look at certain things in the world, and they just reek of 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 committees. You know, and and Apple. You know, Steve proudly proclaimed that there are zero committees at Apple, and that that Apple, in effect, runs like the world's largest startup. A bit of an exaggeration, as Steve tended to do, but um, but not that far from the mark. I mean, having worked inside bigger, more complicated companies. Uh, yeah, I got a very, very different feeling inside, you know, working in Apple. Uh, Ken Siegel, the author of Insanely Simple. Uh, best of luck with this important and very interesting new book, Insanely Simple. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.